Welcome to the Relentless Weekly Podcast, where we strive to inspire, motivate, and educate you to greater success. I'm your host, Dr. Kelly Henry, and I have a, another phenomenal guest with me today. We're changing gears a little bit. I uh, normally talk with chiropractors or those that are in the, the health interest uh, industry, but today my guest is in the financial interest, int- industry, and he is Stephen Gardner. He's a retirement planner. He's the best-selling author of Taming Wall Street, along with five other books covering financial topics, ranging from dr- traditional advice to alternative advice. Stephen is also a national sales trainer for advisors and ag- agents all over the country. He's best known for his unique way of taking back control of your money and being able to use it to your advantage while it continues to earn interest every single year. His mission is to help strengthen America one family at a time. Stephen lives lives in Utah with his wife and three children. I'm excited to have Stephen on the show with me today. So thank you for for joining me. Please elaborate on the introduction for me, Stephen. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, for having me on today. Um, so, uh, yeah, my, my, uh, my bread and butter is helping strengthen America one family at a time. And um, mostly that is done through helping them with their finances, whether that's getting out of debt, putting together a a tax-free retirement plan, uh, taking back total control of their money, um, you know, going at it with a tax strategy, whatever it is, we we custom build uh, a plan for people. Um, And I've I've mostly focused on educating people through my my six different books. I'm not a, a salesman. I don't, that's not my background. I come from a family of educators. My grandfather had a PhD and taught math in California. My mother, master's degree, she was a teacher uh, for over 30 years. So that's kind of where my my blood and, and my uh, DNA come from. And the books have been wildly successful. Uh, so that that's, uh, that's a little bit more uh, about me uh, often author and educator in the, uh, in the financial industry. Well, to play off of that, that's how I came in contact with you is through your books. Uh, I've read a couple of, of your books and, uh, they're, they're great and really stimulated my thinking and, and got me in contact with you. And now I'm working with you and, and, uh, I am certainly glad that I am. So, uh, good, really good. You. Like you, like you said, you're, you're not a, Pressure sells, and uh, that's what's awesome about you. That sets you apart from from other uh, financial uh, planners and those that work in this field. If you uh, or not if, but do you have an original quote or affirmation that uh, that you use that uh, has helped you with your success and its meaning? You? you know, I don't. I don't know that I have uh, an original that. Um... Well, in my industry, I tell people there, there's a lot of money out there to be made. You just have to make it before you go broke, right? So maybe that <laughs> maybe that's an original one, and and that applies to definitely running a, a medical practice. There's so much money in chiropractic and and being your own boss. You just have to do it before you run out of money. But um, one quote that has absolutely resonated with me. Uh, from the time I read it as as a teenager, I had a, a scoutmaster who was very wealthy, and I would constantly bug him about money. And he'd say, "You know, go go play with the other boys." And <laughs> but it's always been a, something of interest to me. But uh, it came it comes from the the book, "The Richest Man in Babylon," which I've probably read a dozen times. And there's so much wisdom in that book. But the the one that stands out to me the most is he says, "A portion of all I earn." is mine to keep. And that that was such a paradigm shift for me as far as, wait a minute, I, I go to work, you know, 60 hours a week running my own business. And am I setting any of that hard work that results in revenue and profit aside for myself? 
because if not, then I'm not really working for myself and I'm not working for my future. I'm working for Wells Fargo, who I owe mortgage money to, and I'm working for Allstate, who I owe auto insurance to, and the different restaurants that I eat at and, you know, Sprint Self. Those are the people I work for if I'm just working and handing that money off to them. But if I set aside a portion of all I earn for myself, then I am working for myself and I am working for my future. And, and I think a lot of people, especially business owners, uh, they, they forget that a portion of all they earn, all that effort that you put in, all of those one-on-one -on -one consultations with your patients, all of those spinal manipulations and you know subluxations, all of that <laughs> stuff you do, if you don't set aside some of that for yourself, then who are you really working for? Right. And so it, it's good to it's good to put that aside because it, it, it'll build your self-esteem. It'll build respect for yourself. Right. I respect myself enough that I am worth setting money aside from my efforts for myself and for my future. And so, uh, you know, richest man in Babylon, uh, a, a portion of all I earn is mine to keep. And if you regularly do that, it's not going to make you rich immediately. But that starts to grow and it starts to compound. And as your income goes up by focusing on your business, so does your ability to save. And as your, your, your nest egg goes up, you earn more and more interest because you have more of interest, you know, interest has more to earn on. And so uh, you can't plow all of your earnings back into your business. At some point, you've got to take some of that money off the table and, and shift it away from yourself. So that's that's probably one of the quotes that I hear in my own mind. It rattles around in my brain and that I, I bring up with people on a regular basis. A, a portion of all I earn is mine to keep. Well, thank you for that. That is tremendous advice. Um, I really appreciate that, Stephen. On that note, you know, you mentioned you work with doctors, you work with chiropractors. From a chiropractic standpoint, are we bad investors? Are chiropractors typically bad investors in your in your eyes? Oh, you know, I <laughs> I, I hear that all the time. You know, over half my clients are doctors of some kind, um, and whether I'm working with uh, a, a surgeon or uh, a dentist or, or a chiropractor or a natural path. Um, I, I hear that. They don't ask that like you did uh, so directly, but they say things like, <laughs> you know, we're, we're terrible investors or uh, doctors are notoriously bad with money. You know, I'm, I'm not great with money. And um, I, I think that, um, I, I think that's actually very false. Uh, what I found with, with working with doctors all over the country is that uh, most doctors are above average intelligence, uh, very high cues. Um, they seem to grasp concepts very, very quickly. Um, the, the, uh, the unfortunate part and the fortunate part is m many doctors, uh, chiropractors included, you, you've gone through an extended education process uh, for medicine and learning about the human body. And uh, that, that's where your focus has been. And then you, you get out of medical school and you're immediately thrown into, how do I use all these years of, of practice and skills and, and learning to make money? And, and then you're, you're dumped into uh, sometimes running an office and hiring and dealing with uh, you know, employees and being the, the, the hiring agent and being the HR head of HR and being the doctor and being the vitamin specialist and being the sub, you know, it, it, there, there's just so much thrown at you. And so at, at what point running your medical practice, do you have time to be a professional investor? And, and so it, it's not there. And so, but it, that doesn't mean that you're a bad investor. In fact, uh, if people will focus on their greatest investment, which is their medical business, uh, now you're not going to hear a lot of people that are financial planners or, or stockbrokers or retirement specialists. They like they're never going to admit 
that your very best business uh, investment is going to be your own business. They, they will always tell you it's Wall Street or this mutual fund or this, you know, index or whatever. Um, but I can I can just tell you uh, from experience, your very best investment is going to be your own business. And so one, one of the things that I think really trips up doctors is uh, distraction. They get distracted by trying to be a professional investor or real estate flipper or uh, you know, day trading. I, I talk to these people and they spend hours day trading and, and the, the net result is they could have seen more clients, uh, more patients and made more money than they did on the day trade. And in, in most cases, they end up losing more than they win because they're hopping from one basket to the next. They're losing on fees and they're losing, you know, when the market drops. So uh, I, 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 I push back on that, that, that uh, doctors are bad investors. I think they just need to continue to invest time uh, in their, their best investment, which is their own business. And then as they improve and make more money and become better at money management, to shift that over to something that is going to get them a consistent rate of return um, and, and allow that money to go to work outside of themselves, but to, to 100% keep your focus on building your practice uh, and, and focusing on your practice. Um, you know, I think another great investment is, is having a mentor or a coach because many times, and I, I see this in my own, I have to go to an outside person. I'm, I'm too close to the project to see why it's not bringing in the money that I want. And so I, I think sometimes we get so busy working in our business that we forget to step back and work on our business and say, okay, sure. what system could I put in here? How do I collect more? How do I, um, you know, quit giving away so much? Um, you know, th those are the things that are really going to be uh, ways to build your own business. And, and get that going. And, you know, there's really, when, when you boil it down, as far as I see it, uh, there's really three ways to make money in a business. And, and I know that there's a thousand ways, right? But these are the, the basic three is how do I get people to buy from me? How do I get them to, bo to buy from me more often? And how do I get uh, them to buy more from me, right? When, when you really boil business down, it's really just those three things. How do I get clients? Sure. How do I get sure. them to buy from me more often? How do I get them to spend more money when they are with me, right? And and so, um, yeah, again, I, I just, I push back on that because I hear that comment a lot. Um, and if, if people, if, if you saw a chiropractor that was running a really successful business and turning out you know, hundreds, of, you know, six figure chiropractic offices I, I've seen um, from the outside world, Wall Street or, or the average person, they, they, you know, they may look at your finances and go, you're, you're not a great investor, but look at your best investment. It's <laughs> pumping out money. You've got a working business, you know. And uh, so I, I would just say, don't think of yourself as a bad investor. Think of what is my best investment that the, that deserves the majority of my time. And then as this thing is, is building money and, and, and working, then I've got to shift that away. And, and that's really important because um, human tendency is if we have access to something, we usually spend it or we find a reason to reinvest it in the business or one more piece of equipment to buy that may or may not work out. And, and so, um, but so, yeah, I just, and you've, you've probably seen this, the, the, the doctors that make focusing on their practice as their best investment, they're the ones that do really well. And you, you probably see, um, people that try to be a professional investor while running a medical practice just absolutely flop <laughs> in the investment <laughs> world. So you, you, I mean, you rub shoulders with a lot of people and you've lived through this for the last couple decades. So, you know, you, you've probably seen what I'm saying um, in your own life and, and with colleagues. Well, and I, you know, and I really appreciate your honesty in this. And we've talked about this several times uh, about the business being your greatest investment. And I completely agree. Um, Docs tend to lose sight of that for one thing instead of working on it, building up, creating more, a bigger business to create more income. And then 
do some investing that is going to, like you said, be consistent, not a dramatic gain in a short amount of time is to be consistent and gain over time and being patient and actually doing what investing should be done or how it's just investing should be done in compound interest over time and have a, have a gain, you know, five, 20, 30 years down the road. So I really appreciate your insight um, and, and acknowledging that for, uh, for doctors in particular. And, and like we just talked about for chiropractors and dispelling the, the myth that chiropractors are bad investors. So thank you for doing that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, as, as you were just saying that I did kind of, I don't, again, I don't think that this is an original quote, but th this is something that I think about. Um, so I'll just claim it as original because I don't have a source sure. for it, but um, I have to come into my business every day and just remind myself that I am my greatest asset. Like I, I, I believe I'm my greatest asset. Um, I'm the one that runs the business. I'm the one that interfaces with the clients. I'm the one that builds that trust and then keeps that trust and provides value. And that leads to referrals and more clients and uh, a, a successful business. And so I think, you know, I think all, all chiropractors would do well to start each day with just reminding themselves that uh, I am my own greatest asset and my business is my greatest investment and then go to work, you know, make it a great day with, with your patients. And, uh, but you know, you, we need to, we need to remind ourselves uh, as, as uh, chiropractors and business owners that we, we are indeed our greatest asset. And uh, I love so that. that's great. Yeah. That's another one that I would just throw out there is just, to remind yourself of that regularly. Tremendous advice. Thank you for that. So and you've already given a lot of advice, but if you could, if you could narrow something, a piece of advice down, but the best piece of advice you could give a, a new or maybe established chiropractor on investing, what would you, what would you tell them? You yeah, that? I, good, good question. Um, I would, I would say start saving as early as you can. Um, just to just to get into the habit, uh, you know, give yourself a portion of all you earn as quickly as you can, uh, even if it's not a lot. Just start that habit of saving early and regularly, and that will compound uh, and build over time. Um, the other thing I would say is um, make sure that you are very cautious of what you're paying in fees. Uh, people get feed to death <laughs> and don't, don't realize it. Um, and Maybe that should be one of your original quotes. You get yeah, feed to death. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's in my book. Um, Doctor, your retirement is, you know, just to be cautious of getting feed to death because, you know, most people don't realize that. Like I was talking to a chiropractor uh, just last week and uh, he's totally getting ripped off. He's, he's inside of a program that has over a 2% annual fee. And he said, well, that doesn't seem very high. And I said, okay, well, think about this. Let, let's, say that, uh, let's say that you have $100,000 and it earns 5% uh, for, for the year. And then you have a, a fee of 2%, right? They're going to take $2,100 of the $5,000 increase because with those management fees, you're paying on the growth every year and on the principal every year. People don't realize that. that they pay on the principal every single year. And so if you take $2,100 and divide it into the 5000 growth, they took 42% of the money they earned for you. So you put up 100% of the money, you took on 100% of the risk, and they took a huge portion of the gain. So be, be very cautious of those fees. Uh, the other thing is market loss. Just be very, very careful. People don't realize how damaging loss is. And, you know, many of the programs that we work with, you know, they've consistently brought back 5 to 8% for people. 
And uh, it, it's very easy to look at the market and go, oh, well, I don't want to I don't want to miss out on this 10 percent gain or this 12 percent gain or this 20 percent gain. But they 100 percent want to miss out on the 10 percent loss that we just had this last year. They they want to miss out on the 38 percent loss that we had in, in 2008. They wanna miss out on the three years of double digit losses that we had in 2000, 2001, and 2002, um, but they're not, they're not in programs that will do that. And uh, so we, we have to be uh, very, very cautious of, of market loss because it just takes so long to, to get back to break even, like I'll give you an example. Uh, let, let's say that you had $100,000 and had a 20% loss, uh, which is very likely in a, in a 10 year period. So your 100,000 drops to 80,000. And then the next year, let's say that you earn 10% uh, back each year. So you, you're thinking you're back to break even, but you're not, you still, you're, you're now two years out three years of wasted time and you're still not even back to break even uh, just with a, a simple 20% loss and then two years of double digit gains, you're still not back to break even. That's how detrimental market loss can be where if somebody could just consistently earn five, six, seven, eight percent, they're going to be much further ahead because they're not going to participate in the, that lost money in that lost time. Uh, after the market dropped in 2008, uh, I, I had so many people bragging to me, look at this return that I'm getting, look at this return. And then I would ask one question, are you back to where you were in 2007? And they'd say no. And I'd say, well, then why are you bragging about these returns? They're not real. Uh, I mean, you need them, but they're not real because you're not even back to where you were. And they're like, yeah, you're right. You're right. I just, I needed, I needed something to feel good about moving forward. And, and so th those losses. Um, so I would say become a good saver, uh, watch out for the, the, the fees and uh, watch out for market loss. And, you know, you, you're not going to get rich being a saver. I, I have a great article on the street uh, that talks about you can't save your way to wealth, but you do need to become a good saver and then put that savings to work earning compound interest and avoiding the fees and avoiding the losses. That's how people become millionaires. Um, they either do really well in America with their business or they consistently save and earn over time. Th that's really the two ways to becoming a millionaire other than inheritance, but let's not count that. You didn't, you didn't earn that for real. Right. So, you know, it, it, just, just think about all the people, you know, that have money. They either most likely are older and they saved and earned over time, or they own a business. I, I just I've I've never seen a rich employee early in their career, uh, unless they you know were like a, a tech startup. You know, like oh, I was <laughs> employee number ten at Uber and now I'm a millionaire. But that just doesn't happen very often. No, that's few far. And uh, you know, speaking from personal experience and talking with you, the Particularly, you opened my eyes to the fees and protecting against loss. That was such a wake-up call for me, uh, and, and I'm sure it will be for a lot of docs as they listen to this podcast. So, again, thank you for sharing that. Let's uh, let's switch gears just a little bit, and then we'll go to the wow round, which you've okay. already wowed us with a lot of information already. But uh, <laughs> what was the what was the best advice that you ever received? And it may be financially, it may be whatever you want to put there, but what, what's the best advice you ever received, Steve? Okay. Um, can I share a couple? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so the, the best advice that I received, probably number one, was to become an excellent educator. Um, you know, what I do is considered sales, but I have always found sales to be icky and I, I, I just don't like it. And uh, frankly, I'm not a great salesman. <laughs> uh, but I believe in education and then allowing people to make their own decisions. Uh, but they can't make a good decision un unless they can make an educated decision. And, and so um, I've built my entire business 
around uh, systems and providing good education, either, you know, pointing them to a resource outside of myself, because there are many people more, you know, more intelligent than myself, uh, but then also pointing them back to my own experience and, and the experience of, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of clients and their failures and their successes and being able to boil it down and go, man, if you could avoid that, it's going to save you a lot of heartache and end up with a lot more money. So I, I would say becoming, uh, you know, an educator would be um, big. The other one was um, about uh, seven or eight years ago, I stepped away from my financial practice to help my wife's family get a business up and running. And I, I felt like I needed to because of being family. And uh, it ended up not going well. The, the people that were running the company made some very bad financial decisions and tried to go, tried to grow faster than they, they could. And it ended up, so it's like, man, we're growing, you know, in triple digit percentage. And then by not being able to keep up, a lot of that uh, progress just got wiped out. It was almost like watching somebody push a boulder uphill and they're so excited then and then at some point the boulder just rolls back on you and completely crushes you <laughs> um, that that was the that was the experience as an outsider and and uh, I, I got caught up in that and I'll tell you that affected my self-esteem for a long time because I went from being a, a high earner running my own business and doing really well to trying to step in and and help family. Um, and then realizing I, I got to go back to doing my own thing. And this was around 2012 or so, maybe 2011, uh, but jumping out. But I got to tell you that first year uh, that lingered with me. I, I mean, I, I, I kind of felt like uh, you know, I was disappointed, maybe mildly depressed. Um, I, I just I don't know what it was. I, I kept wondering, how did this happen? And yet things were going good in my in my own financial practice and they were building and uh, I went to this conference and this guy gave this speech or talk about uh, failures and successes and he went through a bunch of failures and then ultimately who the who the person was and the kind of success that they had and then he ended his talk by saying I'm asking you to dream another dream mm -hmm. and I tell you Dr. Henry that hit me like a slug to my chest Boom. And I, I wrote that down. I'm asking you to dream another dream. And that, I mean, I still get chills when I think about it because it had that big of an impact on my life, on my family, on my business. And I started dreaming again, like, okay, I can get back to this. I can be, I can be who I want to be. I can run the business I want to run. People want to do business with me. And, you know, I just, I started to believe it again. And I started to dream and think big again. I, I got in the habit of thinking small. Yeah. And don't don't ever get in the habit of thinking small. I mean, get in the habit of thinking so big that people kind of make fun of your big dream, right? So, Absolutely. but I, that 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 was one that that was the probably the the if there was like a turning point in my life, uh, it was when that guy said, "I'm asking you to dream another dream." And uh, so may maybe there's somebody listening to this, you know, today and and they're, you know, thinking too small with their business or they're just not getting past that plateau of success or they're dealing with self-esteem issues or wh whatever it is. Right. Um, I I'm asking you to dream another dream right now today and uh, think, think. I'm big. Feeling some other. Yeah, there, there's got to be. And it's a good thing to remind yourself, um, you yeah. know. It's the dreamers that that have the biggest impact, you know. They the are. Steve Jobs and the the Walt Disney's. These guys had big dreams. So anyway, that that's probably the, <laughs> the some of the best advice. And it wasn't directed right at me, but man, it hit me like it was. Fantastic. So that's you know, I appreciate your honesty and the and talking about the struggle you had there for a little while. So one thing I I frequently tell my clients is hey, there's no such thing as failure. There's only feedback. So, you know, don't, don't look at things as failure. Look at them from a perspective. Of, okay. That didn't go quite as planned. What can I do different? How can I approach it different? What can I do to change the circumstances or the outcomes? So, but I, yeah. I really like that. Is that another, that's great stuff. So. 
what uh, what what's an invaluable resource that you utilize regularly or read or a piece of technology that you use that uh, that helps you with your your business or with your life? Okay, um, probably the best book I've read in the last decade uh, was not a finance book, believe it or not. Um, it was a uh, working on your business, as I've been sharing, um, but it's uh, by Roger Hamilton. And it's called uh, the Millionaire Master Plan, and you do you do have to take a quiz. I don't remember. I don't think it costs anything because it was a code in the book. But um, he's a he's a business coach, uh, actually from uh, Asia. Um, he has a, a boot camp in Bali, and uh, anyway, uh, somebody turned me on to his book, Millionaire Master Plan, and I read through that, and I was like, oh my gosh. Uh, I, got, I just got to dig in and implement some of this stuff. It, it was really profound and figuring out my own personality. Um, you know, there, there's different personalities in, in life, in family, in business. And um, I had to figure out, uh, so my personality, it was a uh, mechanic. That, now, that, that doesn't mean I should be an auto mechanic or a diesel mechanic or airplane mechanic. What it means is I see, I see a problem or uh, a system and my brain automatically starts figuring out how to improve that. How do I make this better? How do I streamline that? It, it, I've always been that way, but until it was pointed out to me, I never realized that that's how my thinking is. And, and so um, it was really important for me to see that because then as I would run into investments or programs, I could read them and I could go, okay, what are the pitfalls? How would I improve this? How would I explain this? What educational material would I build? Um, so that, you know, the millionaire master plan was really good. Uh, the other thing that it was, it came out of that was the importance of having a, a mentor or a coach. Um, somebody from the outside that can say, hey, I've walked this path. Here's how to walk it more efficiently. Or that has outside eyes that can look in and go, oh, man, uh, you got holes in your bucket that you didn't, you, you can't see. And, and if I plug those, um, y you know, your bucket's going to fill up with more money. Um, and, and so that was really eye opening. Um, so Millionaire Master Plan, probably the best book I've read in a decade, um, use it in my own business. Uh, it also helped me with my investment, you know, my own private investing and stuff. Um, another valuable technology for me um, that may not apply, but it has been uh, valuable is Amazon. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I've, I've, uh, I've authored six books. I financed all of them. Uh, myself, artwork, uh, paying to have it edited, uh, layout design, printing, all of that. Uh, it, it is a giant pain in the butt to do a book, I got to tell you. And I don't know why I did it six <laughs> times. But I guess after I had uh, figured out number one, having my mechanic personality, I, you know, now it's not as hard. And I've actually helped uh, three or four people to, to do their book and do it efficiently. But Amazon is huge for me as a distribution. Well, I'm glad you wrote those books. So just to be honest with you. So yeah. We may not be on this podcast together if you didn't write those books. So thank you oh, for that. Even though yeah, they're paying the book. Yeah. And, and I think you and I met, you know, a couple of years ago and, it, you know, then you were selling your practice and you did, you know, really well selling your practice. And now uh, the new guy uh, that has taken on, I mean, this, this was such a leapfrog experience for him uh, as far as his career. I mean, he should be in debt, you know, uh, in, in debt of gratitude to you for a long time because you really helped launch his career. Um, but yeah, so Amazon uh, has been really great for me as far as finding people, getting my book out to people, uh, efficiency with printing. So uh, I, I attribute a lot of my success to the help that Amazon has given me as my key publishing partner. Um, and then uh, lastly, I would just say, um, I could not do what I do without the, the investment groups that have invited me to be a part of their organization. And, uh, you know, it's not easy to get on with these firms. You have to have certain levels of production. Uh, many of the, the platforms that I have access to, and, and I didn't know this, uh, you, you have to be invited to be on these platforms. So, you know, 95% of advisors don't have access to these platforms because they're not invited. Now, any client can get on with those. There's not like, oh, you've 
got to be an accredited investor or anything like that. But if you don't know somebody who has access, so uh, probably my greatest uh, asset is giving people access to these programs, but I, I couldn't do it without these programs. And I mean, they are invaluable. So most people don't realize this, but did you know that since the year 2000, the stock market has dropped by over 49% twice? I was not aware of that. Twice it's dropped by twice. over 49%. And uh, Jack Bogle of uh, Vanguard, uh, he said that in the next 10 years, he expects two more major drops. And these groups that I work with during the beginning of the millennium, when we had the dot-com bubble burst and then 9-11, three years of double-digit losses back-to-back. -back. It was a horrible time to have money in the market. These, these platforms did not lose a dime for their clients. And then in the Great Recession, when we were losing in 2007, major drops in 2008, 38%, and then half of 2009, again, none of the clients in this program lost any money. Wow. And, and so these groups, they've been in business for over 100 years. They don't think like the stock market. They don't behave like the stock market. And they think 50 years in the future. They don't think, okay, we've got a quarterly call coming up in 90 days. We've got to post some success or else we lose clients. They don't live in the same pressure cooker that Wall Street has. And so ultimately over time, They've done better for people. Now, the, the, you, there are opportunities where you can get double-digit returns. That's not the norm. Uh, but if you could just consistently grow your money every year and not participate in these 49% losses every couple of years, you're just going to be that much better off. So I, I have to give props uh, to these groups because without them, uh, you know, I would just be another, another advisor out there who's certified and licensed and and can give you some advice um I, i'm good at all of those things but without access to these platforms I, nothing i say would would have very much value or be a key differentiator in my business that's fantastic so i really appreciate that and, and putting that out there of one the stock market dropping so much and you being available and invited to these different platforms to, to guard against these losses. So um, I know the, the docs listening, the, uh, those that are joining this podcast to, to listen to it are going to want to know how to find you. So how can they find you, Stephen? Okay. Uh, well, they can certainly go to my website, yourbridgeplan.com. Um, they can find me on Amazon, um, you know, Taming Wall Street, uh, would certainly get uh, people. Um, they're welcome to reach out to me at 888-638-0080. Um, and, you know, let, let's say the first five people that reach out, I'll, I'll just send you a copy of Taming Wall Street for free. I'll, I'll cover the shipping uh, as a thank you to you, Dr. Henry, for having me on as a guest. But those would be the ways to contact me, website, uh, or, or just reach out. And, and as you know, I'm a, I'm a no pressure guy. This stuff either makes sense and people move forward or it doesn't. And we just walk away friends. <laughs> and he, he's true to his word there too. So, um, and I'll, I'll have this information in the, uh, this will be in the podcast notes too. So okay, great. Apply that. So, uh, but I just appreciate you sharing that and the generous offer of getting, giving books away too. So y'all need to take advantage of it. Those docs listening, be one of the first five, get a hold of them and get one of those books. It's, it's tremendous, tremendous information. So, well, I just want to thank you so much for being with me today and on the podcast, Steve. And so, and, and just sharing all that you shared, I really appreciate it. I appreciate what you do for me. And I, I'm just so glad that you uh, had the time to join me today. Thank you very much. And I want to thank everyone for listening to this episode today. Uh, you can find Relentless Weekly on iTunes and Stitcher. Make sure you like, subscribe, share it with your friends and colleagues. And docs, if you're stuck in your practice, go to my, uh, go to my website at relentlesscoachingsystems.com. Schedule a strategy call with me. Let's talk about what's going on with your practice. Talk about how we can work together to, to skyrocket your success, your success. Again, I want to thank everyone for listening. Have a fantastic day and keep being relentless in your pursuit of success. I'll talk to you soon.